We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We have found a refuge only you can say. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me on. for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if my God is for us? Neither height nor depth can separate us. separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us hold me in his love neither high nor death can separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us hold stand against us if our God is for us. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. I'm glad you are here to worship this great God with us this morning. Uh, if you are new, in the pew back in front of you, there should be some uh, brochures, some bulletins. Please grab those and take those home with you. And we would love for you, uh, on the back of those, to fill out the visitor card, tear that off, and then put that in the offering plate is all we would ask from you uh, when those come by here in a moment. Uh, and again, just a reminder for uh, our members and, and regular attendees that that's a, a great way for you to get in touch with the, the pastors if there's anything we can do to uh, pray for you and encourage you or support you in any way. Now, let's go through our bulletin for the week. Remember, our verse of the month is John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And what a great reminder for us, uh, the beautiful power of the gospel there. Uh, some announcements for this week. So tomorrow, we have our BCM noonday meal. So we are partnering with the Baptist Collegiate Ministry on campus and uh, providing lunch for college students tomorrow. So thank you so much for everyone who signed up to help supply food for that. Uh, please remember to bring food for that. Uh, Keisha, what time do they need food here? Uh, here. If you're dropping food off here, 11.30. And if you're dropping it off at the BCM by 11.45 at the latest, please. That would be much appreciated there. I still think we uh, need a, a few people who uh, would just want to eat a free lunch and hang out and get to know some college students and invite them to church. So uh, if you're free, uh, come and do that as well. Uh, adults, there is a new class starting up in the fellowship hall. 
Now, that'll be starting this coming Sunday, talk, uh, taught by Dr. Galdamez there. And then our college students, we have our Wednesday Ignite will kick off this Wednesday, uh, the 23rd, with just a welcome back cookout. So if you guys see college students around town, uh, make sure to send them our way. Let them know that we would love to get to know them and hang out with them. And then we will kick off our study uh, through First Peter the following Wednesday on the 30th. Uh, also, um, maybe you didn't notice, it's kind of hot outside, and we plan to cook out uh, like 106 degree uh, weather. So if anyone has any canopies, uh, they would want to uh, let the Murrays borrow for our college welcome back cookout. Uh, we would love you even more if you would have one of those you could give to us for the week. And we'll get it back to you in good condition. So if you do, please let me know. Uh, also, Grace Kids will kick off uh, the school year on August 30th. And then lastly, there's a come and go baby shower for the Cooies. Uh, at the lift on September 23rd for guys and girls come and go from 2 to 4 uh, p.m. to welcome a new baby for uh, David and Laura. Uh, So I think that is all. Uh, One thing uh, we've talked about before, but it's been a little while. Uh, Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And so one thing that the elders we, we wanted to start doing was incorporating more of some gospel uh, stories, some, some testimonies into our worship service from time to time to remind ourselves of this amazing gospel uh, that saves us out of darkness and brings us into God's family. And so uh, Jason Mitchell is going to come up and he's going to share his testimony right now. Good morning, guys. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jason Mitchell. I'm one of the pastor elders here at GBC. Uh, I can't remember learning about Jesus. As far as I can recall, uh, I remember knowing that Jesus was the Son of God, right? And I'm sure a lot of that was growing up in the Bible Belt in the early 80s, so before a lot of you were born. Um, I have a vague memory of going to church with my parents before they separated and divorced uh, when I was five years old. Uh, my sisters and I lived with my mom, and during the summers, subsequent summers, she would send us to VBS, Vacation Bible Schools. Uh, I remember one year uh, at the end of the teaching session, they're saying, hey, if you like what you're hearing about Jesus or something like that, stick around. So I stuck around. No one talked to me. I'm sure I rep- repeated a prayer or something, and then I went back to class. And everyone was excited because now I was a Christian. Uh, I went home not sure what that meant, meant sure what that meant. No one followed up with my family that I'm aware of, uh, and soon I was doing hood rat things with my hood rat friends. Uh, fast forward age 15, I started dating this Christian girl, and uh, her parents did not require her to date Christian guys, but required the guys that dated her to go to church with her. Odd, but that's what it was. Um, but for the first time, I actually had a Bible, and I was like reading the Bible, so I kind of happy that they did that, sort of, but I mean, it was good. So I was at least learning about the Bible. Um, After a couple of months, I made a profession of faith, and I got baptized. Uh, A couple months later, uh, she dumped me, and uh, I was back where I was before. Uh, Later, I realized that I made this profession of faith, and I got baptized to impress her and her family. I felt that's what I was supposed to do. Um, Fast forward to age 18, all right? So my senior year of high school, a lot of my friends were going to church. Uh, They're like, hey, man, you want to go to church? No, I do not. But I was like, hey, if they can get this one guy to go, I'll go. Well, of course, he ended up going, so I said, okay, I'll go. So I went to church with him on a Wednesday night. Uh, We sat on the front row at the end of the service. The pastor came to me. He started talking to me, praying over me. And after a little while, I I just found myself agreeing with him. So I was saved again. And I got baptized again. Uh, Over the next couple of years, kind of felt like I had this identity crisis. um, Asking myself all the time, who am I? Uh, Back in that time, we wore these things called What Would Jesus Do bracelets, and people saw me wearing it. Some of them thought I was this great Christian guy, while others, including myself, wondered how a guy wearing that bracelet did the things he did. Uh, I felt like my life was a lie. 
um, I dated beautiful Becky during this time and during the spring of 2000. We knew that things had to change. Uh, my BCM director said, hey, you guys need to spend some time apart, um, really wanting us to focus on reading God's Word, praying. Uh, and I think it was definitely during this time uh, that God opened my eyes uh, to see that He's holy, uh, that I had sinned against this great God, and there's nothing I could do to save myself. Um, but God sent his son to die on the cross. He lived a perfect life and died on the cross, and then God raised him on the third day. And I need to put my faith in what Jesus had done, right? I needed to repent and believe. Uh, so multiple experiences with God through my life, but I feel that like this is the point where my new life in Christ began. Uh, quickly realized that following Christ did not mean uh, that all my problems were gone, but I did start to feel hope when I was facing these problems. Uh, I want to share two verses with you guys that have helped me uh, through my walk with Christ. Uh, first one is Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, that is often a prayer for me. Lord, you have started this work in me, and I'm trusting you're going to bring it to completion because I'm stupid and I'm prone to wonder from this God I love. Uh, second one is a companion is also in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. So when we follow Christ, we also have stuff to do. His word tells us things that we are to do. Following Christ does not mean we just sit on the couch and do nothing. Some of you are thinking, Jason, you look like you spend a lot of time sitting on the couch. That may be so. Um, others are maybe thinking, how is it that God works and we work? Well, that's one of those great mysteries of God and salvation. Um, but I believe it to be true because God's word says it so, and he who says it so changed my life. <clears throat> I worked through this. I know. Hang on, I'm not done. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. I don't know how, but he did something. Thank you, guys. As, uh, as the elders, we were talking about doing this. Two, two things kept on coming back to us. One, that we would not forget uh, this beautiful gospel by which God has saved us. It's so easy, we see in the Old Testament, God indicts Israel because they forgot who God was and what he had done for them, so that we would not forget what God has done for you who have been saved. And two, to call us to, to not be silent with this gospel that has changed us, to encourage us uh, that, that there is hope for your lost neighbors and family and friends. This gospel saves, and so let's remember that and let's proclaim that. And then in that name, let's, uh, let's pray as the, the men are here for the offering. Father, thank you, Lord for saving wretches like us. Only in your mercy, Lord, help us this morning to just be more in awe of who you are, how good you are, how gracious and merciful you are, that you would get the honor and glory that you deserve this morning as we, in a moment, give of our tithes and offerings, as we sing more songs to you, as we hear your word preached to us, and as we go out of these doors, that you would get the honor and glory in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, as we hear testimonies of changed lives, this song really seemed to resonate. Um, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? But Jesus called our name, um, and we came out of that grave, that grave of, of being dead to sin. Let's, let's stand together as we sing, Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not
All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name Now your freedom is all that I know The old made you Jesus, when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory, I need a shelter, I was an orphan, and you call me a citizen of heaven, when I was broken, you were my healing, and your love is the air that I'm breathing, I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name, Savior, I'm yours forever. 
Isaiah 53, verse 5. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His stripes, we are healed. friend of sinners, love me ere I knew him, drew me with his cords of love, tightly bound me to him, round my arms to closely twine, the ties that none can sever. sinners, a crown of thorns you wore for me, bruised for my transgressions, pierced for my iniquities, the wrath of God that I
you will stay standing for the reading of God's Word. Ryan is again in Luke chapter 15, and I'll be reading the first 10 verses. This is the Word of God. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will... Be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost." Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful reminder. And Father, as we've heard this passage over the last few weeks, Father, I would just implore you once again to speak to us in a mighty, mighty way, that your Holy Spirit would teach us today. Thank you for the, uh, for the pouring of the Holy Spirit over Ryan as he has studied this text over the last few weeks, and, and give him your words to speak today, and that your Spirit would come through. Father, take this congregation, take us, and may we, may our thoughts, and may our actions toward one another be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Father, we would just ask that you would pour upon us today and that uh, you would speak to us and that we would leave this place changed and leave this place in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you have uh, ever heard a song and then sung it, but only years, maybe years later, found out that you've been singing the lyrics wrong? All along. Yeah, we've all done that. My kids are notorious for that. They, you know, in this car, you'll hear them singing something they've heard, and this, the words can be crazy. Um, one of my family members used to boldly sing, I've been through the desert on a horse with no legs. <laughs> That's not how the lyrics go, in case you're wondering. Well, I was reading about some children who grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer, and uh, what they learned to recite was not always biblically accurate. One three-year-old, for example, thought it was, Our Father, who does art in heaven, Harold is his name. <laughs> Another little boy believed that it was, Lead us snot into temptation. And some sisters used to pray, Give us this steak and daily bread and forgive us our mattresses. So... We all make mistakes, right? There's a story of a florist who mixed up two orders on a busy day. One flower arrangement was to be for a new business that was opening, and the other was going to a family who had a death. And the man with a new business came in really angry and said, the flowers that got delivered to my opening day said, rest in peace. Well, the florist said to him, you think you're mad? You should have seen the family who just left. A bouquet was delivered to their funeral, and it said, good luck in your new location. (laughs) Well, none of us like getting things wrong or being told that we're wrong. And yet, as we have been studying the gospel of Luke, we've seen the religious leaders have been wrong about so many things. They've been wrong about God's requirements for salvation. They have been wrong about their own righteousness. They've been wrong about the identity of Jesus Christ, but last week we saw something that they actually got right, and that was that Jesus was a man who welcomed sinners. Of course, they meant it as a criticism, 
as they grumbled, saying that very thing, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And as we looked at last week, we saw that to receive someone in, that, in a biblical sense of that word means to welcome them into your fellowship, to, to look forward to being with them. And, and isn't that just what Jesus did? He demonstrated, in fact, his welcoming of sinners by fellowshipping with them around the table at mealtimes. In that culture, if you were to share a meal with somebody, that was to share your life with them. But folks, that's the very essence of salvation. God the Son sharing his life with us. Of course, Jesus welcomes sinners. That's who he came to save. He came not for the righteous, who there aren't any, but he came for sinners. He came to save liars and adulterers and thieves and murderers. He came to save the greedy, the selfish, the prideful. What that means, he came to rescue sinners just like you and me and everyone around us. We see that heart of God in, in probably the most well-known verse of the Bible, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does it mean to perish in that sense? Well, He was talking about being denied life in the presence of God and instead to be condemned as a sinner, to suffer His eternal punishment. But God in His love sent His Son to save sinners, to receive them to welcome them into his life. And we just sang that song, and it's so true. Jesus truly is the friend of sinners. And one of the things that this chapter in Luke points out so well is that welcoming sinners is not something that God does reluctantly. No, he does it with joy. God is quick to forgive and long-suffering in his anger. His forgiveness and joy are there for any sinner who repents and trusts in his Son. So let's look at this short story that Jesus told to these uh, self-righteous, judgmental religious leaders of his day. And let's start again with verses 1 through 3 so we get the context. Verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. All right, now remember where we are in our section of Luke. Jesus is slowly journeying toward Jerusalem. These are the last few months of his earthly ministry before he would go to the cross. At this point in time, he's pretty popular with the crowds, but he's very unpopular with the religious establishment. That's growing more and more. And the crowds that are gathering around him are sinners. And, and no, that's not just an accusation of the Pharisees. In fact, it's Luke who says that it's sinners and tax collectors who are gathering around him. These were notoriously sinful people that are flocking to Jesus. Imagine him being surrounded by prostitutes and the tax collectors and the irreligious people of his day. That's who was there. Where the accusation, though, comes in is that the Pharisees and the scribes criticized Jesus because he welcomed these people, these types of people, even fellowshipping with them around the table and again, that was true. He was. He was doing that. Jesus welcomed sinners. And so Jesus spoke to these leaders to confront them in their judgmental self-righteousness. And he does this by telling them a parable. And so we have three parables or three stories in this chapter. We looked at the first one last week in the story of the lost sheep. And this week's story is that of the lost coin. So again, remember this in the context of Jesus confronting these men as they grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So let's look at verses 8 through 10 again. Verse 8, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, 
If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So in the previous story, Jesus had compared himself to a shepherd searching for his lost sheep and rejoicing when that sheep was found. And here he compares himself to a woman looking for her lost coin and rejoicing when it's found. And I, I'm going to take a little bit of a side note here, but I want to point out something that I think is important for us to note in this text. Jesus could have told this story about a man, but he chose to tell it about a woman. And he did this despite the fact that he's speaking primarily to a group of men who were before him, the scribes and the Pharisees. Just imagine the women that were in the crowd around him, how they would have felt for Jesus to include women in his object lessons. This wasn't what the other rabbis of the day would do. It was, but it was the practice of Jesus to reach out to his entire audience, male and female. And we see this through all throughout the book of Luke, all throughout the Gospels. But just in the book of Luke, we've seen Jesus heal a centurion's servant. And we've also seen him raise a widow's son. When he told two parables on prayer, in Luke 11, it was about a man who came at midnight to his friend's house. And then in 18, we'll see the, the parable of the persistent widow. Or we think of when Jesus talked about the sign of Jonah, he used two examples. He said the men of Nineveh and the queen of the south. Jesus performed two miracles on the Sabbath in the book of Luke. One was a woman with a disabling spirit, another was a man who had dropsy. Jesus told two parables of the kingdom of God. The first was of a man who was sowing uh, mustard seed in his garden. You remember that one? Well, the second was of a woman who was working leaven into her dough in her kitchen. And there are many other examples that we could look at. So think about this. In contrast to the teachers of Jesus' day, Jesus wanted to teach women as much as he did men. And to do that, I think, effectively, he would... He made a point of using examples that would relate to their life experiences. Jesus cared for the women in his life and ministry in a way that would elevate their sense of dignity and value. If you think about many of the world's cultures and religions throughout history and even today, many have treated women as lesser, less important, less intelligent, less valuable, having less rights, but not so with Jesus. In God's economy, listen, men and women have differing roles in the church and in the home, but women are not less. They are not less valuable. They are not less necessary. They are not lesser citizens in the kingdom of God. As Paul said in Galatians, male and female, all are one in Christ Jesus. So as an application of that, anyone who would treat a woman with disrespect because they're a woman, or who fails to prize a woman's gifts and service, or who would dismiss a woman's capacity to learn theology, or who would, would put them down in any way, that person does not have the mind of Jesus Christ the one who cares about women as much as he cares about men. Again, I think that that's an important thing that we should note as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but let's get on to the story of the lost coin. Just like the story of the lost sheep, this story plainly teaches how precious people are to God. In this story, this woman had 10 silver coins. Uh, those silver coins were 10 drachmas or the Roman denarius. And a drachma or denarius was one day's wages for a common laborer. So this was 10 days of wages. This is what she had. Now, the story doesn't really give us a whole lot of detail about the woman's financial situation. But notice, according to Jesus' story, this is what she's got. She has 10 coins. That's all the finances that she has available to her. 
and she has now lost one of them. Again, one-tenth of all she has. So this one individual coin, that's pretty valuable. Well, that's a tenth of all you've got. Now, as I was thinking about this text this week, one of the applications that I was meditating on out of this passage is the value that God places on individuals. Because, yes, he, he loves the church. He loves the, the called out, assembled people of God. You know, we are the bride of Christ collectively. But when, when you are saved, you're brought into that number. And he has saved you, the individual. He foreknew you. He set his love upon you. He granted you repentance and faith. And he calls you a son of or a daughter. This is similar to the way I love all of my seven children, but I also love each one of them as an individual. Each one individually is incredibly precious to me. And I think that's one of the things that we should take from this parable is the incredible preciousness that the individual that you have to your heavenly Father. So know this for certain that we are precious to God. Now that Jesus has paid the price for our salvation by dying for our sins on the cross, we are more precious to God than ever. You were bought with a price. So don't wonder whether or not your life is worth living. Don't feel forgotten. Don't doubt that God loves you. I think the story of the lost coin shows that God loves each of us as if we were the only one there was to love. Even when we were lost, we were still precious to God and will be useful to Him when He finds us. Well, last week, we looked at the, the effort that the shepherd put in to locate his lost sheep. And, and notice in our story now this week, the woman's effort to locate her lost coin. What does she do? Well, she lights a lamp, she sweeps the house, she seeks diligently until she finds. In those days... The typical home was only about the size of a one-car garage, and they were very dark. The windows were often very small, wouldn't let in a whole lot of light. Typically, the floors were made of dirt. Oftentimes, they would cover them with straw. Sometimes, there might be a stone paving underneath there as well. Just think of how easy it would be for something like a woman's coin to be lost in a setting like that to be covered with some straw, to be concealed in the dirt or fall into a crack in the stones. And in order to find something like that coin, she would do just like the story. She'd have to light a lamp so she could see, get out her broom, and make a, a clean sweep of the place to locate this. Again, I think we can just imagine her on her hands and knees, just examining every square inch of her home, subjecting the floor to the most careful scrutiny this woman was looking in such a way as to find. And this is what we do when we've lost something, right? Many of you have done this. You know, we look in the obvious places, and then we go back, and we look at the obvious places again, and then we start really getting thorough, pulling things apart, looking in every corner. Jesus was pointing out the effort that's common when we search for something that's been lost. And what we need to see in this is this is the way Jesus looks for lost sinners. He looks in such a way as to find. The reason Jesus came to the earth was to seek and to save that which was lost. This is why he became a man. This is why he performed his miracles. This is why he preached the kingdom of God. This is why he died and rose again. Jesus was looking to find. We revel in the fact that that our salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. It's a free gift, right? It's free to us. But that grace was very costly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of the coin in our story. It exerted no effort to be found. The woman exerted all the effort. Lit a lamp, swept the house, searched diligently until it was found. And that coin's a lot like us, because there we were, dead in our sins, walking in disobedience, following the devilish ways of the world, not honoring God, but just kind of doing whatever our bodies and our minds felt like doing. But Ephesians 2 says, but 
God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. So we are saved by the mercy and grace of God, and that is free to us, but it is costly to God. Let me ask you, kind of an applicational question here is, how much effort and discomfort are you willing to exert to find the lost people around you? Are we willing to get down on our hands and knees and get dirty to rescue sinners? When I was preaching last week, somebody came to mind, and I almost mentioned him, and so I'm going to mention him this week. One of our pastors, Joe Schmidt, is a an incredible example of someone who exerts costly grace to find the lost. I don't know how well you know Joe, but as long as I've known him, Joe has made himself uncomfortable to reach out to lost people in messy, sinful situations. Drug users, homeless, convicts. It's been a regular practice of Joe as long as I've known him. He has spent a lot of time with people that many others would want nothing to do with. Now, just in fact, just this last week, he and I were talking, and he wasn't sharing this in any bragging kind of a way, but he told me of how just this last week, in fact, he had a short window of time that he needed to get some mowing done before the sun went down. He just had this short window. And while he was hurriedly using these precious few minutes of mowing daylight, he received a phone call from a homosexual friend in need. And this man on the other end of the phone was drunk and in a very dark place. So you can imagine the temptation. You know, you pick up the phone and you see who's calling. You know what's going on. You know what it's probably about. You know how much time you've got. But Joe didn't brush him off. He spent time talking with him and then called him back the next day when he had sobered up so he could again point him to the Savior. Folks, that gets messy to get into sinners' lives. I think we see costly grace in the life of the Apostle Paul. He describes his efforts in 1 Corinthians 9. In fact, I'll put it up here. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. Paul said this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. What a blessing, what a joy. When the lost gets found. It's a joy for us when we're found by God, when we were lost. And God himself is filled with joy over finding one lost sinner. We see this in Jesus' story as the woman finds the coin. And what does she do? She calls her friends to gather around her and rejoice with her that she had found what was lost She's overjoyed. You know, the people in these small, tight-knit Jewish communities would have shared each other's sufferings as well as their joys. And so for her, finding this precious coin was a cause for celebration. Now again, remember what this story is aimed at. It's aimed at these Pharisees. In their self-righteous contempt for sinners that they considered beneath them, they failed to see God's passionate concern and love For those people, they failed to join in the celebratory joy of heaven over sinners who would repent. Look again at verse 10, and we'll see Jesus' application of this story. Verse 10, Jesus said, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I mean, we know the joy when we find something that's been lost, even when it's something kind of small. You know, something small and valuable, like, hey, look what I found. I've been looking for this everywhere. Shelly sees me do that all the time because she's always moving my stuff. 
and then I can't find it. So repent, honey, please. I'm going to hear that later. Um, but Okay, so we find the joy in things that we found, but how much more joy when Jesus finds a lost sinner? The joy, in fact, here in verse 10, the joy that Jesus refers to is God's joy. That's the joy that fills heaven. It's the joy in which the angels are basking. Yeah, I think the angels are rejoicing too. But notice what it says. It says the joy that's before them. That's the joy of God himself. Jesus said, so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So how dare these prideful hypocrites grumble that Jesus is welcoming sinners. How else could they be brought to repentance except through the welcoming love of Jesus Christ? Again, I think that the meaning of this parable is really clear. It's pretty obvious. The woman represents God in Christ seeking lost sinners in the, in the cracks and the dust and the debris of a dirty world in sin. He initiated the search for those sinners who belonged to him through his sovereign choice of them. Since just like this lifeless, inanimate coin, they could do nothing to save themselves. And having found the lost sinner, God restores him or her to his heavenly treasury and then expresses joy in which the inhabitants of heaven get to share. Now, one of the things I think we need to touch on for a few moments, is this demand of Jesus that people should repent. His demand for people to repent is central to his message of the kingdom of God and to the gospel itself. It has been my observation through the years that there is confusion and disagreement as to the meaning of the words repent and repentance. And so I want, to, I want to ask you to try to track along with me for a few moments as we consider this. There are some believers who do not believe that repentance is part of the saving response of the gospel message. In fact, we had a visiting minister who said that very thing from this pulpit a few years back, that we shouldn't call people to repent, we should only call on them to believe in Jesus. And I, I think... Again, what this comes down to is is a misunderstanding of what the Bible means by repentance. If you hold that view, often in their understanding, they believe that repentance means this. When we say repentance, we're saying you have to change your behavior. Okay, Or it can mean that you're sorrowfully confessing all your sins to God, asking Him for forgiveness. And let me say this. If that were the definition of repentance, I would agree with those folks. But that's not what the Bible means by repentance. What I want to help us understand this morning for just a few minutes is the biblical meaning of repentance. In Jesus' message, repentance is, listen to me, is not a change of behavior. It's also not just a sorrow for sin. Instead, repentance is an inner change, an inner turnaround. It's not a work that we do, but an internal change that will give rise to new works, to God-centered, Christ-exalting behaviors. Again, I want you to listen to these verses from the gospel, and you hear Jesus call for repentance over and over and over again. I'll just, I'm just going to read these quickly. Matthew 4.17, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 1, chapter 14 to 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Or Luke 5, 32. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Or Matthew 12, 41. Jesus said, the men of Nineveh, you remember what Nineveh was? Where Jonah went and he preached and they repented. He didn't want that to happen, but God granted it anyway. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is right here. Or Luke 13, verses 3 and verse 5. 
Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, the reason I read <clears throat> those verses is I think we, one of the things we need to note is the fact that the first and most basic command of Jesus' public ministry was that, repent. He gave this command indiscriminately to everyone. All people need to receive the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and repent. And this is a call for a radical inward change toward God and toward his rule over them. Now, why do I say that? Let me, I want to point to two things, I think, that, that show us that repentance is an internal change of heart and mind and not just sorrow for sin and not merely improvement of behavior. The first is this. Many of you know what the Greek word is behind the English word repent. It's metanaeo. Okay? And this word is a compound word. It's made up of two parts. The second part, well, let me mention two parts. You've got meta and naeo. Okay, those are the two parts, meta and naeo. The second part, naeo, refers to the mind, to the thoughts, to the perceptions, dispositions, and purposes. So this is the internal purpose of our direction. Okay, that's what naeo means, this internal being of who we are. The first part is the prefix to the word, meta, and it means with or among or after, and it regularly carries the idea of movement or change. You might think of the word metamorphosis, okay? That's that same type of word. In fact, um, sometimes it's translated that way. In Philippians 3, it talks about when Jesus returns that he'll transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And that word there is metaschismatizo, meta change of our scheme or our form. Satan also changes his form. He masquerades or disguises himself as an angel of light. So again, that change of form. So what I'm getting at is this. The basic meaning of the word repent, if we just look at the word itself, is to experience a change of the mind's perceptions and dispositions and purposes. So it's not works. That's what's often being claimed. In fact, I'll tell you, the Bible college that I went to would say this. If you tell people to repent, you are adding works to salvation. Well, I'm sorry, then Jesus was adding works to salvation. Then the apostles were adding works to salvation. No, because that's a misunderstanding of what this word is. That's not what I mean by repent. That's not what Jesus meant by repent. The basic meaning of it is a change of your disposition, your perceptions, your purpose. It's an internal change. So again, just look at the word. Now, the second factor, I think, that points to this meaning of repent is the way it's used in Luke 3, 8. And it's the relationship between repentance and our changed behavior. In fact, I have Mark put Luke 3, 8 up here, at least part of the verse. This is uh, John the Baptist here. And he said this, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Okay, bear fruit. So there, notice that those are two different things. You've got the repentance that takes place internally, and then the fruits or the actions that come out of it. Now, when John said that, the people said, John, what should we do? And so he gave them some examples. He said, if you've got two tunics, share with the one who doesn't have any. And if you've got food, do likewise. And so I think what this means is this, is that repenting is what happens inside of us, and it leads to fruits to new behaviors. If you have been changed inside, now let your behaviors demonstrate that change in your heart and your mind. So again, listen to me. Repentance is not the new behavior or the new actions, but it's the inward change that bears fruits of new behaviors and new actions. Now, I want you to think about it this way too. This kind of struck me as I was considering this. For Jesus to demand this is so much more than had he just said, change your behavior. This is so much more radical. He's calling for you to be a a new creation, for there to be a total change in all of your thoughts and dispositions from where you once were. Jesus was and is demanding that we experience this inward change. Okay, why do people need to change? Why can't they just stay as they were, 
in the internal purpose of who they are. Why do all of us need repentance? There's a simple answer for it. Because we're sinners. That, in fact, that was Jesus' answer for it, right? He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So repentance is something that sinful people need, that sinners need. Sinful people are called by Jesus to repent. The rebellious human, living according to my way, needs to repent. Think of uh, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to what? Our own way. There's a need to repent there. So, okay, why, why do people need to repent or need this change? Because we're sinners. Well, what's Jesus' view of sin? Well, Lord willing, we'll look at the parable of the prodigal son next week. But listen to how Jesus described the prodigal's sin. He said he squandered his property and reckless living and devoured it with prostitutes. That's how Jesus described the prodigal's sin. But when the prodigal repented, when he had a change of heart and mind and he came back to his father, here's what he said. He said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So Jesus pictured the prodigal son's sin as throwing away his life on reckless living and prostitutes doing And his doing that was not just a sin against his father. He said it was also a sin against heaven itself. And what does that mean? It means against God. Heaven is his abode. Sin is against God. And that is what we need to understand about the nature of sin itself. The essential nature of sin, according to Jesus, is that sin is an assault on God and his kingdom. When we sin, we are robbing God of His glory. We often want to kind of belittle it and and not think of it as that big of a deal. But this is a sin against the eternal, infinite, holy, perfect King of Kings. We see this also in the way that Jesus taught His disciples to pray. In fact, look at Luke 11.4. He said that they should pray in this way. I'll put it up here, Luke 11.4. Forgive us our sins... For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And in this verse, Jesus compared the sins that God forgives, our sins that God forgives, to the sins that people commit against us, and he calls those debts. So what Jesus' view of sin is that it dishonors God and it puts us in debt to him. Now listen to me. That's a debt that we are responsible to repay but we cannot repay. Think about it. How could you repay the debt of dishonoring and belittling God? What could you possibly do to restore that? We can't. We have no way to restore the divine honor when we have defamed God by our God-belittling thoughts and behavior and attitudes. That debt can only be paid by Jesus Christ himself. The Son of God came to give His life as a ransom for many. But listen, for us to receive the ransom, to enjoy that gift, what does Jesus say we must do? We must repent. Let me give you just a short definition of repentance. Repentance means experiencing a change of mind that now sees God as true and beautiful, and worthy of all of our praise and all of our obedience. And that's how we embrace Him. And that's how we embrace Jesus Christ. As 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God is the one who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And one of the things we need to understand about repentance is that no one is excluded from His demand. He made this clear. He had a group of people come to him and say, hey, Jesus, you know, what, what do we do? How do we handle this when um, all these innocent people who Pilate massacred in the temple? How do we handle that? Or what about the, the Tower of Siloam? And it fell on it. It killed these people. And what they were thinking was these people deserved it because they were, you know, the really bad sinners. But do you remember how Jesus responded to them? 
He said, unless you repent, you likewise are going to perish. In other words, he's saying, don't, don't think that those calamities mean that these are the sinners and you're not. All people need repentance. Just like all people need to be born anew. So all people must repent. Why? Because all are sinners. When Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, he did not mean that there are some people who are righteous and don't need to repent. We talked about this last week. What he was pointing out was that there are some people who think they're righteous and they won't repent. And then there's others who recognize their debt, their sinful estate, and they heed Jesus' command to repent. And they're the ones who are set right with God. Think of the example that we'll look at in a few weeks in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember Jesus' story about that? He told told the story because there were people like the Pharisees who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. And so in that story, we've got this drastic contrast between the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee is standing over here on the side going, Oh God, thank you that I'm not like all these other people. I, you know, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all I've got. And I'm, I'm definitely not like this tax collector over here. Thank you, God, that I'm me. And then what do we see of the loathsome tax collector in Jesus' story? It says that he beat his breast saying, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus wraps it up and he says, That man went down to his house justified, declared righteous by God. And the point here is this. No one is excluded from the command of Jesus Christ to repent. All people need to repent and the need is urgent. Unless you repent, you will perish. And what, kind, what does that perishing mean? Well, that perishing is eternal judgment. It's the final judgment of God. Jesus was warning people of the coming wrath and at the same time offering one avenue of escape if they will repent. And if you don't repent, Jesus has one word for you. The word is woe. Woe to you. And I think this is why this demand, this command to repent is part of Jesus' central message of the kingdom of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? What's the gospel of the kingdom? It's this. It's the good news that the reign of God has come, that the rule of God is here, and it has arrived in Jesus as he saves sinners, and it arrives before he returns And that time it will be only in judgment. So this demand that people repent is is a gracious offer that he's here to forgive. And it's a gracious warning that those who refuse it will one day suffer in God's judgment. Okay, but is repentance for today? Because again, in in the school that I was trained in and the way that I grew up, they would say that that was a previous dispensation. The repentance was what, you know, was preached during Jesus' life. We're now in the church age. Um, well, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, told his disciples, his apostles, what to do. And the command was, go and preach repentance to the people. Let me put up Luke 24, 46 to 47. This is after Christ has risen from the dead. He's given his instructions to his apostles And he says this, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Folks, you know what that means? That means that is for us today. The demand of Jesus to repent is for all people in all nations, and it comes to us, whoever we are, wherever we are, and it lays claim on us. This is the demand of Jesus for every soul. Repent. Be changed deep within. Replace your God-dishonoring, 
Christ belittling perceptions and dispositions and purposes. Replace those with God treasuring, Christ exalting ones. So, yes, church, the repentance is demanded and is beautiful when God grants it to someone. Our God rejoices with shouts of delight over one sinner who repents. And praise God, He is the one who searches out lost sinners until He finds them. Let me end with one beautiful example of the way Jesus looks for lost sinners. And this comes from the Bayview Glen Church in in Toronto, Ontario. A few years ago, Pastor Sam Nasser was preaching in Persian to an Iranian congregation. And Pastor Sam was troubled by the fact that there was this woman sitting in his church who was talking on her cell phone the entire worship service. And at first he was thinking this must be some kind of an emergency, but it happened again the following week, and so he was just really disturbed by this. And so he asked the woman to meet him in his office, and and he was confronting her about why she, she was causing this distraction in church. And she said, Pastor, I already told you, My husband in Iran is very interested in how I became a Christian because of listening to you. Well, he still didn't get it. He's like, I don't understand. What do you mean by that? How is this causing your disruption? And so he wanted some further explanation. And here's what the woman said. So I bought this calling card, and I call my husband in Tehran so he can hear you preaching. He puts the call on speakerphone so my mother and sister can hear too. They have been inviting our other friends and family over for the past three months. They've been listening to you preach. More people are coming every week. I'm not talking on the phone. I'm I'm just holding it up so they can hear your message about Jesus. Well, the next Sunday, Pastor Sam invited her to sit right up in the front row where she could get a really good reception and hear well. And that week, he preached on the love of Jesus for his precious children at the end of the service, he asked if, if anyone wanted to trust in, in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and suddenly the woman with a cell phone started to shout, My husband! My husband! My husband got saved! My mother and my sister want to come to Jesus too! You know, even if he does it over a cell phone halfway around the world, Jesus is still looking for lost sinners. He's looking for them every time someone preaches the gospel. He's looking for them right now. I pray that he has found you or he will find you. And listen, if he has found you, that he will then find you willing to exert costly grace to reach others as well. Rejoice. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. God, thank you for finding us. Father, when we stop and we just see the the depths of our depravity and the magnitude of our rebellion against you, how, how little we have often thought of you, of how many times we have spoken so sharply and condescendingly and selfishly with our tongues, We have belittled other people made in your image. We have used your name in vain. We have committed adultery. We have hated our brothers. Even if we haven't murdered physically, we have often murdered them in our hearts. And we think, why in the world would you save a wretch like me? God, thank you that you place a value on us that we can't understand, but that we must be eternally grateful for. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us and sending your Son to live the perfection that we would not and could not and to die to pay for our crimes against you. Thank you that He repaid the debt that we never could. Oh God, let us rejoice in salvation. Thank you for getting to hear again the story of my my brother, Jason, and how you so graciously called him out of darkness into your marvelous light. 
Father, may we never get over the fact that you've saved us. We are so unworthy. You are worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor. God, fill us with the joy of your presence and use us for the glory of your name. We pray in the mighty, precious, and hopefully soon coming name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together.
forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing I want to introduce uh, you to some new members that have, we've got a few more that are going through the process, but this morning I'd like to introduce you to Molly Hutchins, Vernon and Sarah Friesen. Y'all come on forward here, and Junior and Madeline Jones. Junior's got to unstrap up here. Y'all come stand up front here where we can see your beautiful faces. 
These, these folks have gone through the membership class. They have uh, interviewed with the elders, and uh, we are presenting the, to them to you as the newest members of Grace Baptist Church. And so I would ask you, but if you're a member especially, before you head out of here, come up and, and shake their hands or give them a hug, whatever you're, they're comfortable with. Vernon loves hugs, so <laughs> grab them and give them a big hug. Uh, but come welcome them uh, to our church. And let me close with just a little bit of Scripture here. The Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he has judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. Do you ever feel that about you? Why did God save you? Oh, he gets to show how patient he is with someone just like you that he might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal and visible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And in that you are sent.